Today on this episode of the Brain Surgeon's Take, we will be discussing what is it like to undergo brain surgery with CNN anchor and chief national affairs analyst, Cassie Hunt. Get an insider's perspective on having neurosurgery performed, not only the physical experience, but also the emotional stress and mental decision making. Much more on this podcast episode. Welcome back, everyone. Here's my take on Cassie Hunt. She is a world-renowned journalist who is recognized across the globe. But more importantly, she is an incredibly brave and resilient human being. Undergoing brain surgery is obviously a life-changing experience that requires both mental and physical fortitude. Cassie not only underwent brain surgery without taking a step back, but she actually came out a stronger and better version of herself. As a neurosurgeon, I learned so much during this interview. I perform roughly 800 brain surgeries per year, so naturally the gravitas of each procedure gets a bit lost. But after speaking with Cassie, I realized how important it is for me as the surgeon to always remember that a normal and routine day for me is a life-changing event for entire families and circles of friends. In my opinion, neurosurgery is the best job on the planet mainly because of the enormous impact we get to make on a daily basis. And this interview with Cassie further endorsed that belief. Kudos to Cassie and all similar patients for being so brave and trusting us with your lives. Being a neurosurgeon is a privilege. I never forget that. Listen up as we discuss what is it like to undergo brain surgery? Check it out. Hey, Casey, how you doing? Rick, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm all right. Listen, I'm super excited to talk to you today about your experience going through brain surgery. Uh, you know, obviously it's something I do every single day, but talking to someone like yourself and seeing what the other side is like is always very informative. <laughs> you guys are amazing. I mean, oh. I'm in awe of what you do. Oh, well, thanks so much. And obviously it takes a lot of courage on the patient's part. And that that's what we'll get into a little bit today is how you prepared mentally, not only physically, but mentally for undergoing brain surgery. Um, you know, take us back to the original diagnosis. How did you first find out that you had a brain tumor? Yeah, so um, it was a little bit of a process um, in, so this all kind of unfolded in 2021. So we were still kind of in the thick of COVID, which made everything a little bit more um, difficult. I, um, I was still doing uh, the show that I was doing that at the time I had a studio in my basement. Um, so I was doing that every morning. Um, and one morning, actually, during the show, um, I suddenly um, started to get, like, basically, the letters on the teleprompter started swimming, right? The the words that I was reading, uh, you know, and I had to, I got through, I was, at the time, I was anchoring from five to six, I was supposed to continue to do things throughout the day. And I had to call them and say, you know what, I really can't, I can't do this. I had what I thought was a really bad migraine headache. Um, migraines run in my uh, family. And so it seemed like a pretty um, safe presumption um, that it was something that presented as like a, a doctor would call it a migraine with aura, right? Where you, um, you know, your senses are, are, are off or you lose your balance. Um, and something like that had happened to me once uh, before, but only ever once. Um, and I had gotten that checked out at the time, actually, and been cleared um, with an MRI. Um, so this time, you know, I tried to treat it with, uh, you know, through my doctor, I took um, medications like Imitrex, some people that follow you may know about it's kind of something that uh, doctors will use to try to mitigate the symptoms of migraine. Um, and it just wouldn't go away. It was like the, the medicine helped, um, but it wasn't enough. And so I was sort of barely getting through my days, you know, I was I was getting up every day, I was doing the work that I absolutely had to do. And then I was spending a good chunk of time like under the covers with an audiobook um, because I couldn't handle anything else. Um, you know, light in particular, I was really sensitive to light. Um, and so it took a couple of months to get an appointment. Eventually one, a doctor that I worked with for a long time, just in my regular life um, said, you know, hey, I think you really should see, she was the one who was helping me with um, the Imitrex and the other medicine, like you should see a neurologist and see what's going on. Um, and the neurologist, you know, I talked to her and she had, um, you know, some other ideas around treatment um, but she said, uh, you know, including there are medications called SNRIs, which is if, if anyone takes take an antidepressant, it's kind of the next generation of that kind of a drug. Um, so she suggested I try that um, to mitigate the headaches. But she said, you know what, like you're a new patient. I'm just going to send you for a baseline MRI. 
um, have it looked at to make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, and it was that scan um, that found a very small, it, I mean, it looks like a dot, right, on, on the scan, um, like, like really, really, like almost like a, a little bit bigger than a, than a pencil prick or a pen prick, uh, but it was there. And, you know, I didn't know how to read these scans at the time. So, um, you know, after I got the MRI, got the MRI um, you know, a couple of days later after my doctor got the results, she called me. And she, she has a very calm demeanor in general, um, but she was very much like, well, like, I think we should get this um, looked at. Like, I think you need to make an appointment with this other doctor. And she, whatever, you know, I, she, I'm very grateful for how she treated me because she sent me for this initial scan, but she also never said anything. She never used the word tumor. She never used the word cancer. Um, when I figured out how to go back and read these scans later, I found the radiologist notes um, and he basically said he thought I had a glioma, which is, you know, would have been a cancerous uh, tumor and that I should be immediately seen uh, by an oncologist. So um, I did end up at a neuro-oncologist at that point, um, you know, who then looked at my scan, sent me for additional scans. And the, the basic reality was that they could see this spot on the, on the MRI, but they had no idea what it was. Um, they didn't know if it was a tumor. They didn't know if it was, you know, vascular um, you know, a bleeding of some kind. They didn't know what was going to happen. I had another scan about a month later and it didn't show any change, right? So over a, the course of a month, it hadn't grown. Um, and so they thought, well, we just, we don't know what this is. Um, and so in the meantime, I, you know, started getting treatment for the headaches. The SNRI actually really helped me. So I was kind of back on a better track of being able to like live my daily life. Um, and because it wasn't moving and because we watched it for several months, they just thought, well, we'll just leave it alone. You know, we figured out how to address your symptoms. Um, there's no signs that this is aggressively growing. Um, we're just going to watch it, um, and see. And she basically told me I should get MRIs every three months for the following year. And then we would like kind of reevaluate what was going on. Um, and in the meantime, I actually was starting a new job. You know, after, after my health had basically been cleared, I went ahead and, you know, we were, we were. I, I was, you know, making this decision about whether I was going to leave my old uh, job and, and come to CNN where I am now. And, you know, obviously when my health was in question, I had some hesitance, but after everyone, they, they all thought, ah, this is okay. Uh, we don't have to worry about this. I thought, all right, I'm going to just move forward and live my life as I would, as I would otherwise. Um, and then when I went to get uh, the three month scan uh, later, um, that's when I found out that actually the tumor had grown a little bit. And that's when my doctors were able to look at the scans and say, this is a tumor, this isn't something else. Um, and so it was at that point where I sort of had to make a decision, okay, what am I gonna do about this? Um, and I, I actually went to, I got two separate opinions um, from two uh, sets of doctors and they both said completely opposing um, things. So um, obviously I live near Johns Hopkins Hospital, but I have um, family ties to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, my dad was working there at the time, um, and it just so happens that um, our neighbor from when I was growing up, we, our, you know, I grew up with his kids, my, my parents are very close friends with them, um, is the CEO of, of Penn Medicine. And um, so first I talked to the folks at, um, at Johns Hopkins, and when I talked to their surgeons, uh, you know, they took a look at the scans, and they were similarly kind of baffled, as my other doctors had been. They were like, we're not sure what this is exactly. Kind of, now they knew it was a tumor, but they didn't know what kind of tumor it was. Um, the surgeon that I spoke to said that he thought it was likely a cancerous tumor, uh, but he also said it was so small that he was reluctant to recommend surgery because he was afraid that if he went in, he wouldn't be able to find it. Um, so I said, okay, that's one opinion. Um, but then, you know, because of our, our connections with Penn, I was able to get uh, put, be put in touch with Dr. Dan Yosher. He runs uh, neurosurgery. Um, there and is now my um, personal Superman because he looked at the scans and he said, he called me, um, he was very, he got it in front of their tumor board, uh, which was, you know, I'm sure you're very familiar with this, a group of, of doctors, um, sometimes from, you know, specialties outside of, um, you know, uh, neurosurgery, um, who sit and look at scans and try to figure out what's going on. And he took a look at it, he sat with the tumor board and, you know, the day or two after I had had my MRIs, I had my dad hand deliver all these MRIs because trying to get them through the computer systems was too complicated. So he walked him into his office um, on CDs of all things. Uh, and he looked at, he called me. Um, and like I said, I had just, I had just started this new job. And he, he said, 
you know, look, I think I know what this is. I think that I think this is, this is something called a hemangioblastoma, which I can explain to you later. Uh, but I think that it's causing your symptoms. And uh, the hardest thing about, you know, if you were to decide to go in and do it, he's like, you don't need to, but I think it's causing your symptoms. Uh, and I think if we went in there and took it out, it would give you some relief. Uh, he said, the only challenge here is how small it is. Uh, and, you know, the hardest part of the surgery is going to be locating it. Uh, but that's my problem, not your problem. And I said, great, let's do it, uh, is basically kind of how um, it all it all unfolded. So um, it was honestly very interesting and illuminating for me to be in the situation where I had, you know, two sets of, you know, arguably some of the, the top um, doctors in the country telling me two completely opposite things uh, about what was going on with me. This episode of The Brain Surgeon's Take is brought to you by Vitamin Water. Vitamin water is the ideal way to hydrate, replete your electrolytes, and maintain wellness. I drink vitamin water routinely during the day in order to keep up my energy and focus. Check out vitaminwater.com for more information and use the promo code BRAINSURGEONSTAKE for 20% off your first order. Once you get that diagnosis and you know that you need surgery and the surgeon is telling you that you need surgery and you agree to it, Take us through your mental preparation. How scary is that realization that you're going to have brain surgery? Yeah, I mean, it was a lot, uh, I will say. Um, you know, and, and we did, I mean, this was a case where it was, I don't want to say it was optional, but it was a situation where, you know, I wasn't being told that if I didn't do the surgery, the consequences were going to be such that my life would be over, Right. So, you know, Dr. Yosher was very kind of clear with me and saying, look, if you decide, he's like, I'm not going to pressure you one way or the other on this. If you decide this isn't the right course, you know, I understand. But he also was pretty, um, I mean, he was extraordinarily responsible, as I know you have to be when you're talking to patients about kind of what to do in these types of situations. Um, but he did say, you know, on balance, he believed that the benefits of doing the surgery would outweigh uh, the risks and would also make a substantial difference in my quality of life. Um, and so, you know, the other, the other thing of course, was that we didn't know definitively what it was. He had an idea of what he thought it was. Um, but, you know, and he said, he said this to me at the time and, and, you know, I talked to Sanjay Gupta, who is our neurosurgeon at CNN, who was kind enough to spend some time on the phone with me also. Um, and Sanjay said this to me and Dr. Yosher said this to me, uh, but they were both like, yeah, you know, you're a journalist. In Sanjay's case, he said, you know, I'm a journalist. Like, we want to know what these things are. Um, and that can be really, um, you know, can really affect how you think about what's going on. And I couldn't handle the thought, despite the fact that brain surgery was a daunting possibility. I couldn't handle the fact, I couldn't know that there was something growing in my head. And I didn't know what it was. <laughs> um, so, you know, we decided, my husband was, you know, agreed and, and was very supportive. Um, and then it was, yeah, a question of like, thinking about, okay, what am I going to do to prepare? Um, you know, and I have to say that, you know, the, the surgery itself, like I didn't even really think about or worry about what it would be like to um, physically undergo the surgery from the perspective of like, um, I had so much confidence in Dr. Yosher and I wasn't like afraid that it was going to be painful or worried about them cutting open my head. Um, I was worried about my uh, children, my child at the time. I have two kids now, uh, but at the time I had one um, and he was two, he just turned two. And, you know, I think that the implications around brain surgery are such that, you know, obviously any major surgery, there's a chance that you won't wake up at all uh, and that the worst could happen. Um, I, you know, I, I was pretty convinced that that wasn't gonna be the situation, but, um, you know, there's also the possibility when it's your brain that you wake up, you know, you, you're not yourself, or at least that was something that I um, thought a lot about, right? That something could happen that would affect the person that I was, um, you know, that would prevent me from, you know, being um, with my, seeing my kid grow up, you know? Um, and, you know, there's also the reality that when you're a parent, uh, the logistics of putting your affairs in order uh, are, it's both critical um, and also uh, pretty heavy because you have to think about what your kid's life is going to be like without you in it. Um, 
and I think that exercise, like I feel a little bit emotional just even like talking about it right now because, you know, it's it's just not really something that, I mean, you, it's not something that most people really have to grapple with in like a very, in a, a real concrete way. Like this thing is happening to me tomorrow. And, um, you know, obviously tragedies happen in life and all the time and you have to plan for them if you're, you know, responsible in this way. Um, but that piece and going through that, um, it honestly really changed kind of how, like to this day, I am a different person because of having gone through that kind of process of thinking about what, what, um, what I would miss, you know, what I wouldn't be here for. Um, and so that's kind of how I, that, that was really the, the thing that was the most like emotional and, and remains like the most defining thing about this entire experience for me. So I want to get into that a little bit because you went through that and I suspect 99.999% of my patients go through the exact same emotions. The day of surgery, you're about to go under anesthesia, you've got your own health, your family, all of that is just running through your mind. Discuss again the importance of trusting your doctor and how that has to be a major part of your mental game at that point. Yeah. I mean, I think it's everything, right? I mean, uh, like I, you know, it, in some ways the experience of having talked to two different doctors and having one that was much more uncertain about what was going on, um, was really helpful in this case because I, you know, I just, it's really, really hard to describe. Um, but Dr. Yosher is just so incredibly good at what he does. And he is also, um, you know, like it was very clear to me that he knew the difference between when he could say something that he felt like he could do and when he couldn't. Right. So I never once felt like I was being misled. Like he was, you know, not, um, being straight with me, um, or doing anything. I mean, he never did anything that, that undermined or made me question, um, his abilities or, um, his manner or, or anything. And, I don't, there was just something about my relationship with him and um, that, and, you know, I mean, you're right. Like you're putting your life in someone else's hands, right? Like you are handing them everything uh, when you do this and you do really have to have, and for some reason, I just had this unshakable faith in him that, you know, no matter what, I was going to be okay with him. Um, you know, I mean, I, I obviously knew that like, there's always stuff out of your control, you know, that, and, and he warned, I mean, the, the, the biggest risk with my particular surgery, um, <clears throat> so it was a, it, it was in my right cerebellum, which is, you know, the back, like near, near the base of your skull, um, but in the inside the skull, not in the neck. And, um, the biggest risk in, I, I learned, uh, in this, uh, operating this area is bleeding, right? So, and in this case, the hypothesis that Dr. Yosher had about my tumor was that a hemangioblastoma is a, a highly vascular tumor, which just means there's like lots of blood vessels and therefore a lot of blood. And large ones are very, very, can be very, very bloody and that can be risky. Mine was really small. So he wasn't so much worried about bleeding around the tumor. Um, but in the event that there is, you know, it can get trapped in that is my understanding. And, you know, please <laughs> correct me or share more with me because I, um, I only have this one experience, but they were, they basically had to be prepared for if there was bleeding to be able to get it out, get the blood out of that area as fast as possible. And that was kind of the risk that I faced. Um, and that's the kind of thing where, you know, I mean, and again, Dr. Yosher was like very upfront with me about this. Like he like explained, this is what could happen. This is what we're looking out for. This is how I'm preparing for that. Um, if that happens, I don't think it will for these reasons, but you should know that this is what we'll do if it does. Um, so, I mean, just, I, I, so I, it just being, you know, actually like going into the, and I, I remember he came in, and this doesn't always happen. I don't think, um, cause surgeons, I mean, you guys are so, so, so busy. And then, you know, obviously some people have emergency brain surgery, they don't have the opportunity or the time, uh, but he came and sat with me before the surgery. Like while I was waiting to go in, I was his first surgery of the day. Um, you know, and I could almost tell he was like a little bit nervous. Um, you know, like, but the way that that felt to me was that, you know, he felt like it was really, it was really important to him that, you know, I was going to be okay. And I thought, you know, if, if, if he thinks that this is this important, 
um, I am going to be okay. He sat with me and my dad uh, ahead of time. And, you know, there was this huge question too um, about, you know, and I think my parents in particular were very focused on, like, we didn't know if it was a cancerous tumor or not, for sure. Right. Um, we said, we, there's just no way to tell from the scans. And I, all I had was, you know, Dr. Yosher's uh, feeling that, or not feeling, like medical understanding or hypothesis that this was something else. And I just never doubted that for some reason. I, when I, the first, I mean, after he called me and said, this is what I think it is. I just was like, this guy's absolutely right. Like, this is the first time I had spent six or eight months with people not being able to tell me what the hell was going on inside my head. And here was, he was the first guy who ever said, oh, this makes a ton of sense. It makes sense with your age. It makes sense with where it is um, in your head, because that was the other piece about my diagnosis. Um, and part of why everyone was so freaked out and I sort of skipped over this part, actually, when I was telling you the story of how we got to the tumor. Like, the main theory was that it was cancer that had come from someplace else, right? That I was a young woman, I was in my 30s, that it was most likely um, breast cancer or skin cancer or cancer from somewhere else, and it had landed in my brain. And so the initial course of like how to figure it out was to scan me from head to toe. So, you know, I went and had, I had multiple mammograms and, you know, a cyst removed and I had, I went to a dermatologist and I got, um, I had my insurance deny a PET scan, which would have made me not have to go through any of this, but you know, modern insurance, um, they wouldn't pay for the type of scan that can tell you if there's cancer anywhere in your body. Um, so I had to do all the other things. I had a CT scan for kind of head to toe to check if I had it anywhere else. And like, it, I didn't have any cancer anywhere else. Um, and so I was, when he said to me, like, that's, it's not cancer, it's this, and here's why I thought, you know, he's right. And I just never worried about that. My parents, I think when the, when the, when the, when it was all over and the, the pathology report came back, I think they really were like, had this huge sigh of relief that I just didn't feel because I had never been worried about it in the first place, which maybe was, you know, naive of me. Uh, but I think it sort of speaks to your question of like, trust in um your providers and uh i don't know he's i think i called him my superman earlier and that's i don't know it's just how i feel about him yeah i mean i know dan he's a he's a colleague and a friend and you couldn't have picked a better doctor he's he really is phenomenal and i think that trust level is so important because like you said the patient you or any patient is handling you're basically handing the keys to everything to the doctor at that point in time and no amount of reading no amount of kind of research is going to help you understand brain surgery. Cause as I tell my patients, I can't teach you brain surgery in five minutes. It takes almost a decade to learn. So I think that trust is so, so critical. Now take us through your wake up kind of first things you remember, first things you saw, what was your recovery? Like how long till you were Casey again and a hundred percent back to the grind? Um, yeah, sure. Well, so, uh, you know, I woke up obviously in, um, what I assume was the ICU, although to be perfectly honest with you, I'm not really sure. I, I did the hospital at the, uh, the, the surgery at the, at the hospital of the university of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I grew up right outside Philadelphia. So, um, you know, kind of felt like home. Um, my husband was with me, I think. Um, but it's kind of very, and then I think my dad came in and then I think my mom, um, I remember most vividly my mom because she, and I think this is only because she repeated it to me afterward, like right after, relatively quickly afterward, which was that I think the first thing I said to her was, um, you know, I'm myself, like, hi, mom, I'm, I'm me, right? Um, and so that, you know, I, I never, my recovery was not such that I ever felt like that whatever it is that makes you, you was in any jeopardy, you know, right from the moment, I think that was the thing I was probably the most worried about, right? Um, and so the thing that I was quickest to say was like, oh, I still, like, I'm still Casey in my head. And like, I, you know, these are my fingers and, um, you know, my brain is kind of working in the way it should. It's what I do remember um, is when I first woke up, you know, they ask you, <clears throat> um, I was in a lot of pain. I have a, a funny condition that I've, learned about through a variety of different experiences, but um, I don't really respond to um, fentanyl-based pain medication, basically. Uh, so um, it doesn't work as well as it should. Like, you know, my epidural failed when I had a baby kind of thing. Uh, and so in a situation like this, right, it's very painful. And I was in a lot of pain when I woke up. And they're very hesitant to give you more pain medicine in this kind of a situation, as I'm obviously you know, but people haven't been through this because they don't want to cloud, you know, your... 
um, your judgment and your ability to speak. They, they don't want to be, they want to be able to tell the difference between what is the impact of the surgery you just had and what's the impact of the drugs that you're taking um, to mitigate the pain. They're obviously necessary, but they try to, you know, find a, a balance. Um, and so there, I was in a lot of pain. I really wanted more pain medicine. And they, right, right when I woke up. And so they're asking me all these questions to try to like confirm that that, that would be an okay thing to decide to do. Um, and, you know, they're basic ones, you know, like, what, I don't know if it was what month it is, or I, I don't remember any of the others, except that they asked me, who is the president of the United States? And I was like, this close to saying Donald Trump, because Biden was the president of the United States at the time, which of course I knew very well, having covered his election. Uh, but my life was so defined by covering Donald Trump for so long that I think, you know, my brain was kind of stuck back in 2017 <laughs> to 2020. Uh, and hadn't caught up yet with the reality that 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 part had changed. But I did catch myself, and I think that's actually when they decided, okay, she's fine. <laughs> like, not only did she answer the question correctly, but she laughed about it. So, uh, so yeah. Um, and then, I mean, from there, you know, um, I was I was incredibly lucky. Uh, the uh, person I was working for at CNN at the time who had hired me, Jeff Zucker, um, no longer with CNN, but he. Um, was incredibly wonderful to me. And I've talked about this publicly um, because I had just started a job with him. Um, and he basically said to me when this happened, he was like, I don't want you to worry for a second about what's going on here at CNN. I want you to focus 100% on you um, and getting better. So we will be here for you um, when you are um, ready to be back. Um, and I think he just gave me an incredible gift because um, you know it's a privilege that many, so many people who go through this just don't have. Um, either they're not able to keep their job through something like this while they recover or, uh, you know, they they have very strict rules. They're, you know, terribly financially impacted and all that. And, um, you know, he I will never forget uh, that he did that for me um, because it does take time. I mean, my my. Um, you know, the 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 impact on, you know, the brain tissue and I, I actually be interested to hear kind of how you think about things like this, but um, the area like it, again, it was a very small tumor and, you know, a relatively low impact in terms of how, you know, the, the way that the, the tissue that had to be affected in order for him to access the tumor and all these things. So I sort of had the, the best case scenario from that perspective in terms of a recovery. Um, it also, and this was another piece of, you know, the diagnosis and thinking through the surgery that um, was you know, I think reassuring for me is that this particular region of the brain, there are some things there that relate to language, but not, it's not extensive the way other areas of the brain control language. Um, it's mostly related to kind of balance and equilibrium. Um, so like, had I been a professional athlete, I think I would have been uh, concerned about the impacts. You know, I think I felt reassured um, by him saying it's unlikely that this is going to impact something that you use to do your job every day or to, you know, kind of function in the world. And that was actually what I experienced during the recovery. I mean, a lot of my uh, rehab was, you know, putting one foot up a stair then the other foot on the same stair and then both feet back down again. And, you know, from the outside, it would look like, what is this person doing? Like, why? This is not hard. Um, but it was exhausting um, to do it <laughs> kind of over and over again. <laughs> Um, you know, that I had to like sit down afterward. Uh, and it wasn't because the, I mean, the muscles in my legs were fine. It was the, the work of, you know, my brain figuring out like, you know, if, if you think about, you know, taking like my, my brain knows that this glass of water is this full and I'm not throwing it on the ceiling and I'm not dropping it, like right, knowing how to do that. Um, and so th there was a little bit of that. And, and Dr. Yosha said to me, you know, you might miss a stare, you might, you know, your balance may be a little bit off. And it's funny, my watch, my Apple watch, I wear an Apple watch all the time, figured it out. Um, you know, basically thought I was an elderly person who was in like more danger of falling than I previously had been. It started kind of alerting me to this fact, like a week or two after I came home <laughs> and started doing these things. I mean, technology is wild. Um, and and the, the, I, I went back to work after about four months. I mean, we we're in the midst of, of launching um, the project I had gone over there to CNN for. Um, and they were going to launch the show and, and all of that. And so I, I ended up taking about four months, three, three and a half months, four months off. Um, but the reality was like, I, I don't, I didn't know it at the time. You know, when I went back to work, I thought I'm ready. Like it's, it's going to be great. Um, you know, and I absolutely gave it my all. I think after six months, I sort of looked around and realized that I had been running 
you know, at 60, 70% for the previous couple of months. And that I, you know, my, my, my recovery was not really complete until six months after I had done the surgery with Dr. Yosher. And it's kind of hard to describe like how that would be. It's not like there were no outward signs. Um, it was just, you know, I think I needed more sleep. I think every, um, you know, a lot of the sort of the thinking and kind of the going, the mental gymnastics of your day, um, they just took more energy for a while. Uh, you know, and now I don't think about it ever. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's in, when I sort of looked around in April of, of 2022, I thought, oh, okay, now I'm, now I'm back. Like now I'm back. I've made a, you know, I felt like, okay, I've made a full recovery. Uh, it was kind of, it was nice to feel that way. It was a little unsettling to realize I ha- it took that much time. Um, but you know, it, it definitely is a process, I think. Uh, but now, I mean, I, you know, I have a pretty intense scar on my head. Uh, and it took a while for, you know, Dr. Yosher was, was very careful to not shave, you know, to shave a little bit of your, of your hair to do a surgery like mm-hmm. this. And, you know, I was like, I'm on TV, like, don't take off my hair. And he was like, we'll be okay. <laughs> you know, he's like, I'll be extra careful. <laughs> uh, so I had to wait for the hair to grow back too. But, um, you know, that's kind of that, like, that's what all I'm left with is, is the, the scar, which is really just kind of like an indentation. There is a titanium plate in my head. He calls it a manhole cover, which I think is... <laughs> Well, irreverent, but I'll take it. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I always tell people that the best part of being a neurosurgeon is the chance that we have every single day to make such a tremendous impact as you're explaining to us, not only on the patient, but their friends, their family. Tell us how this life-changing experience, undergoing brain surgery, changed you as a person, perspectives, priorities, the way you value family, how are you different coming out of this surgery? Um, you know, I, I mean, honestly, like I, I feel dramatically different. Um, and I, I feel that, you know, I, part of me wondered, okay, is this going to go away? Um, is it going to evolve? Am I going to forget? And, um, you know, it's been two years and so far the answer is definitely not. Um, I am definitely a different person, uh, now than I was before I did this. Um, I think, you know, the thing that I have thought about over and over again is that, you know, I was 36 years old when this happened to me. Um, You know, it's a time when you ideally have at least half of your life still to live, right? Um, And I just felt that I had been given this, this gift of being able to clearly understand and see the things that mattered and the things that didn't at a time in my life when I still had time to change the way I was living. Um, And, you know, I I wouldn't say that, you know, my family has always been very important to me. Um, You know, I wouldn't say that my values were fundamentally changed by this, right? Um, I'm still, you know, I'm still, I still know, like, I'm still articulating the same set of values that I would have articulated before this happened. But I think what's different is that, you know, um, there's having the values, there's professing the values, and there's living them every day, right? And, you know, I think we all strive to live up to our values, but we also, you know, go through periods of time where perhaps we're giving we're doing that less than we would like, or we're giving lip service to the values that we hold. Um, What this has done has made me, now it's like every time I make a decision, big or small, it is, what is the, you know, what do I, what do I value? And am I living that out right now in this small decision? And I am, I do make different decisions about things, especially around family. Um, Because, you know, when I, honestly, when I was working with a lawyer to like lay out my life. And when I was thinking about, you know, sitting there in the hospital with Dr. Yosher right before, um, you know, going under anesthesia, like I wasn't thinking about whether I'd ever be on television again ever in my life. You know, I was thinking about uh, my son and am I gonna see him graduate from college or get married or, you know, like he was only two, I barely had a chance to meet him. Like, what's he gonna be like, Um, you know, how's he, you know, I like, 
I, I still, I still have to go off to kindergarten, right? Like, who's he going to be friends with? Like, what if he gets bullied in school and I'm not there to help him, you know, like, um, those were the things that I was thinking about. And, you know, I, and also like my husband and I were at the beginning of building a family, um, you know, would he not ever have a chance to have, you know, a sibling, um, you know, so now obviously he has a sister, which is kind of the, like the, the, the bow on top of the story is that, um, you know, it, it all worked out and, uh, you know, but I just, um, you know, and, and I think some of it is too, is like, when in my life this this happened to me? I mean, had I been, you know, a, a, in my teens and, and I not had a chance to have the kind of professional success that I've just been so lucky to have enjoyed, you know, I think, I'm sure I would have thought about all the things that I wanted to do with my life that I was going to miss out on, um, you know, uh, from a professional perspective, um, you know, I, I was very lucky to be able to look back and say, well, you know, I've interviewed the president of the United States. Like there's a photo on my wall of me interviewing president Biden when he was, you know, in South Carolina down and out, but on his way to winning the nomination and becoming president of the United States. Right. Like I've had these incredible opportunities. And it also, I would say that actually also put things in perspective for me. Um, because, you know, I think especially in a town like Washington, it's easy to get caught up in, um, like honestly petty um arguments and um feuds and fears and insecurities about you know where you are and where you stand and what your status is and you know and honestly um you know cnn's had ups and downs and um you know obviously i left one company went to another company um you know i think that had i not gone through this i would have fewer tools to handle adversity right? Um, in an industry that can be very um, destabilizing if you allow it to be. And that I think has been um, also a really important part of it for me, because I think it has really allowed me to see um, and enjoy the things about, you know, working in the news in a public way at a very critical time for the country in a way that, you know, it just helps me sort out what matters about that from what doesn't, because it is very easy to get dragged into things that just do not matter. Um, and they are big things and they are small things. I mean, you know, everything that happens day to day in a control room, I mean, the number of things that can go wrong in a TV broadcast, it's like, you think you know them all, and then the power goes out in the middle of your show. You know, it's like, you just, it's, it's, you can't know them all. And, you know, I've seen people react poorly in stressful situations. And um, that's not to say I, I, I blame them, but it, it is a very like human thing. Um, but I think having gone through this makes me feel like, you know what, this is television. This isn't brain surgery. Like it's a cliche, but like, it's a cliche for a reason. You know, it's like, if I screw up at my job, like, yes, there are consequences for sure. And I owe a lot to the American people, to viewers, to, you know, to tell the truth and to not make mistakes. But also, I mean, like if Dr. Yosher had made a mistake, like I might not be sitting here today. Um, and so, and he didn't, <laughs> and I don't know how you all live with that pressure every day. I really don't. Um, because, you know, certainly the pressure I feel on myself to get it right is as high. Um, and I, I, I just, it's, I'm in awe of, of what you guys do. So I, I guess I, I guess I would just say that like, yeah, it has fully changed how I live my life every day. What, what I feel is important to me. And, um, I feel really, really lucky. Um, like, I, I don't know that I would have ever said I feel lucky. I sort of can't believe that 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 you can say that sentence, right? I was lucky to have a brain tumor at the age of 36, but like I was. Final question. What would you what would be your single piece of advice to anyone that has to undergo brain surgery? My single piece of advice. Um, I mean, I honestly think my single piece of advice. Um, hmm. I think it goes back to what we were talking about before. Um, I think it is um, trust your doctor, you know, trust um, and trust yourself um, that you can, you can overcome it. You can get through it. Um, and I would say, you know, if you, do, if you don't trust your doctor, you should, you should be looking for a doctor that you feel like you can trust uh, because it's really everything um, uh, because, you know, I also didn't feel like I was doing this alone too uh, because of uh, Dr. Yosher. 
my family, of course, but, um, you know, that, I think that, that, that is just so critical, um, to both an actual successful outcome and also to feeling like your outcome, um, was successful because obviously, you know, everyone faces different kinds of prognoses. Um, you know, I've learned through doing, you know, having conversations like this and being asked by others to, you know, work with groups of, uh, brain tumor survivors that like, you know, I had one group tell me like, Hey, cause I said, you know, Hey, I didn't, I didn't have brain cancer. Like, I don't want to, you know, get up in front of a group of people and say that I know what their loved ones, they and their loved ones have been through because like, I just don't, you know, I didn't have to struggle with that. I was lucky. I, it didn't happen to me. And they said, well, you know, there's just so few survivors. Um, and that, you know, really has stuck with me too. Um, you know, that, I, and, and really <laughs> made me feel again, like the, the, the privilege of the position that I'm in, um, is just really, really remarkable. So yeah, I mean, I think if you have a doctor that you can trust, um, that's what you need uh, if you're going to if you're going to put somebody's life in your hand, if you're going to put your life in somebody's hands. Casey, what an amazing interview! I can just tell you, uh, as we talked about early on, as someone who does this every single day, you get up, you go to work, you think about it. But obviously, it's like anything else; it's what you do every single day. It's very easy to lose the gravitas of what we do on a daily basis. And I think talking to you and hearing your perspective is so educational for me because I know it's a huge impact, right? I know that I'm changing people's lives, but you don't really know until you really talk to the patient or someone like yourself who tells you how it changes priorities, values, more time with family, what really matters in life. And so I, thanks for spending the time with us. This has been an incredible interview and thanks for opening up and just telling us what you went through. A lot of people wouldn't have <laughs> been comfortable sharing that. And it was, it was, it was great. Uh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for, for, uh, for the conversations that you have. I mean, they are, they are so important. I mean, what you do is, I think it is, it's a giant mystery and it can feel scary um, for people who, you know, are facing it, but they don't know where to turn. And so I think having these kinds of conversations is also incredibly important. And obviously the work that you do is so incredibly uh, important. I mean, thank you um, to you. I mean, to the, the entire profession. I mean, I owe you, I owe you guys everything. Well, make sure you say hello to Dan for me next time you see him. <laughs> I will. I didn't know you knew Danny. He's great. <laughs> oh no, Dan's great. Dan's a colleague and a friend. He's He's fantastic. Um, all right, I will. Um, and uh, let me let me know. Um, send me the the link. I know. Certainly, my mom is very excited to watch. <laughs> oh no! Of course, of course, absolutely. I'll definitely send you the link and and um, and have a great weekend. All right. Thanks, Rick. You too. 